Hello everyone, and welcome to DM Tools with Max McCool. On today's episode of Monsters Manifested, we're going to be covering the Crawling Claw. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. The Crawling Claw takes up page 44 of the Monster Manual, and its lore goes as follows. Crawling Claws are the severed hands of murderers animated by dark magic so that they can go on killing. Wizards and warlocks of a dark bent use crawling claws as extra hands in their labors. Magical Origins Through dark necromantic rituals, the life force of a murderer is bound to its severed hand, haunting and animating it. If a dead murderer's spirit already manifests as another undead creature, if the murderer is raised from death, or if the spirit has long passed on to another plane, the ritual fails. The ritual invoked to create a crawling claw works best with a hand recently severed from a murderer. To this end, ritualists and their servants frequent public executions to gain possession of suitable hands or make bargains with assassins and torturers. Creator's Control A crawling claw can't be turned, nor can it be controlled by spells that control undead. These foul monsters are entirely bound to the will of their creator, which can concentrate on a claw in sight to mentally command its every action. If the Crawling Claw's creator doesn't command it, the claw follows its last command to the best of its ability. Commands given to a Crawling Claw must be simple. A claw can't be tasked with finding and killing a particular person because its limited senses and intelligence prevent it from tracking and picking out specific individuals. However, a command to kill all creatures in a particular locale works. A Crawling Claw can easily feel out the contours of keys and doorknobs, crawling from room to room on a blind killing spree. Malign Intelligence A crawling claw possesses little of the intellect and memories of the individual of which it was once a living part. The hate, jealousy, or greed that drove that person to murder lingers on, however, amplified by the claw's torturous, fragmented state. Left to its own devices, a crawling claw imitates and recreates the same murderous acts it committed in life. Living Claws If a crawling claw is animated from the severed hand of a still-living murderer, the ritual binds the claw to the murderer's soul. The disembodied hand can then return to its former limb, its undead flesh knitting to the living arm from which it was severed. Made whole again, the murderer acts as though the hand had never been severed and the ritual had never taken place. When the crawling claw separates again, the living body falls into a coma. Destroying the Crawling Claw while it is away from the body kills the murderer. However, killing the murderer has no effect on the Crawling Claw. Undead Nature A Crawling Claw doesn't require air, food, drink, or sleep. And that's it for the lore on the Crawling Claw. It's followed up with a little blurb, which goes as follows. Makes you wonder what can be done with all those other murderer parts, doesn't it? By Evangeliza Levane necromancer okay so pretty dark and nefarious already in terms of the origin creation actions and overall nature of a crawling claw which makes it pretty interesting because the crawling claw as such is a a fairly low challenge rating creature i mean in fact it's the lowest challenge rating of zero but they've given it a lot of rich lore and information that we can certainly use to develop some interesting thematic aspects for an adventure or series of adventures. But without further ado, let's jump into the stat block. The Crawling Claw is a tiny undead with a neutral evil alignment. It has an armor class of 12, hit points that average 2 or 1d4, and it has a movement speed of 20 feet as well as a climbing speed of 20 feet. The Crawling Claw has a strength of 13, a dexterity of 14, a constitution of 11, an intelligence of 5, a wisdom of 10, and a charisma of 4. The Crawling Claw is immune to poison damage, as well as the charmed, exhausted, and poisoned conditions. It has the sense of blind sight for 30 feet, in which it is blind beyond that radius, and a passive perception of 10. The Crawling Claw understands the language of common, but it cannot speak. And as previously mentioned, the Crawling Claw is a challenge rating of zero. On to the ability. Turn Immunity. The Claw is immune to effects that turn undead. And finally, 
the action. Claw, which is a melee weapon attack with a plus three to hit, a reach of five feet on one target. On a hit, it does an average of three or 1d4 plus one bludgeoning damage or slashing damage, the claw's choice. And that's all we've got when it comes to the stats for the Crawling Claw. So as I had mentioned before, it's a relatively small, low challenge creature, pretty simple and not very tough necessarily for your party members to overcome, let's say. But although the stat block is fairly simplistic, I believe that the lore provided to us in the text is detailed enough and incorporates enough elements in it for us to create something that could be pretty interesting when using the Crawling Claw. So, without further ado, let's jump into some adventure crafting. Now, immediately, what I see with the Crawling Claw, especially due to the fact that it is such a low challenge rating, would be something to the effect of perhaps not a main creature or monster for your players to contend with, although you certainly could do that in a couple of ways, which I'll present a little later on. But for the Crawling Claw, in my eyes, I see it as a sort of secondary or tertiary enemy type that your players would have to deal with in a couple of different circumstances. So, for example, the first thing that comes to mind with a Crawling Claw would be something to the nature of a messenger system. So perhaps there's a faction or guild or some sort of cabal of individuals that are presumably nefarious and ne'er-do-wells due to the fact that they use these sort of necromantically turned undead creatures and hands of murderers and stuff. But there's some form of faction that implements crawling claws in the way of a messaging system, kind of in a similar fashion as to messenger pigeons and carrier pigeons and stuff like that, where rather than use birds or creatures of flight or have a humanoid individual behaving as a messenger in order to maintain some sort of uh, discretion, what they would do is they would incorporate crawling claws because crawling claws can take simple instructions and they can sort of snake away and sneak around and get through all the cracks and crevices and holes in the walls and deliver or retrieve information to whomever is on the other side, right? You can also use crawling claws to behave as sort of these underground messaging systems in that, in a literal sense where, you know, birds or other airborne creatures would be spotted in the sky, land roving creatures such as humanoids or any other form of creature that walks upon the ground, crawling claw included, but they could be spotted by individuals just roaming the streets, let's say. However, you could use a crawling claw and have the crawling claw be sent perhaps under a sewer system or something like that effect. And they crawl about and come out the drain pipes and stuff like that with little scrolls sort of tied to them or, and stuff like that. It's something that I thought was very cool if you were to implement the crawling claws as this like messenger system or messaging system would be for something to the effect of like perhaps a thieves guild or some sort of necromantic evil organization of arcane users. And perhaps these crawling claws have been taught some form of signaling or sign language that allows them to communicate with the recipient of the information. Now, Crawling Claws are relatively unintelligent. They have an intelligence of five, so it's like a minus three mod to their intelligence. But perhaps for the sake of intrigue or rule of cool, if you would, you could have Crawling Claws perhaps know how to do hand signals for communication or perhaps even very small and simple spells of some sort, a la cantrips, but perhaps even simpler than your standard fair cantrip, right? And I think that that could lead to a very intriguing sort of investigatory adventure or even campaign for your players due to the fact that you can generate towns or cities, villages, what have you, that are sort of infested with crawling claws and perhaps because they only traverse at night or in the shadows and stuff like that, perhaps the charge or the, the mission originally that they receive is to clear out a town or city or village or area of a city of this infestation of giant spiders because nobody really knows what they are. 
if you went the route of the underground sewer system type thing, you could then implement sort of visual aid to invoke a sense of stress or paranoia with your players where perhaps they see a, a shadow crawling along the wall where there's a little bit of light or reflection from the water flow in the sewer. And as they look to the wall, they see a quick skittering of a giant shadow of what seems to be some multi-legged creature just kind of skittering across through the perpendicular pipe or something like that. And you can invoke all sorts of strange stuff, strange situations using a, a crawling claw. And then additionally, if you went the route of having them set up as a communication of some sort, you can then have interception of scrolls or letters. You could perhaps have an entire scenario where the players, if you went the way of hand signals, the players have to decipher and decode what these hand signals are referring to, what they mean. You know, imagine sort of in the way of like a thieves cant where it's this layered form of language in which perhaps due to the fact that the crawling claws can only perform very simple actions and motions, the, the communication system, if using hand signals, is simplistic with just certain movements and bends of the fingers and stuff like that. But perhaps the previous or following hand signal indicates the context of the next or previous hand signal, right? But that's getting a lot more involved with a specific aspect of an adventure rather than the adventure itself. So let's bring it back. So another way that I could see Crawling Claws being implemented as more of a direct contender or a direct opponent of the party would be as a swarm, quite simply, just as a swarm of Crawling Claws. Perhaps there's a, I mean, you could go very straightforward. There's a wizard or warlock in a tower just outside of town and what they do is they exhume the graves perhaps or perhaps there's a group of bandits or brigands or vandals of some sort that they hire to go and exhume bodies from a plots from from grave plots in a cemetery or a graveyard perhaps the graveyard or cemetery is specifically designed to inter murderers, killers, evil individuals in order to separate the evil individuals' bodies from the decent people of the town. So there's two separate graveyards. And because of that, the graveyard of the bandits or brigands and what have you never really get noticed or perhaps the, the grounds aren't kept at all. Individuals don't go visit the people that are buried there, perhaps due to the fact that they were villainous individuals in their waking life and perhaps anyone who was related to them is racked with shame or guilt for their actions or their behaviors and therefore the graveyard gets left unattended unless necessary where a murderer has been executed or has been judged guilty and sent set some sort of death sentence or perhaps died in the stocks or died in the dungeon in prison type thing and then you can have a couple of adventures sort of set up immediately by just using this one system of individuals sent to town to deal with grave robbers. They track the grave robbers. Grave robbers lead to a wizard's tower or domicile. Then they have to contend with the wizard and the wizard's small army of crawling claws, right? Now, another way that I could see an interesting adventure implementing a crawling claw that doesn't necessarily invoke a cruelly nefarious sort of abject evil aspect to it would be perhaps a cult or thieves guild or band of assassins or something like that. And the rite of passage for initiates that are hopeful to join the ranks of this group, if you would, are tasked with this form of canonization or ritual where they acquire a target. They're charged with taking out a target they murder the individual. Shortly after murdering the individual, the initiate goes back to the chamber or the safe house of the faction or of the group, and a ritual is performed upon them, perhaps by a warlock or wizard or necromancer of some sort, where they amputate the hand that was used to deliver the killing blow to the individual they amputate the hand, the necromantic spell of creating the crawling claw is set in motion. And after the ritual of converting the hand to an undead crawling claw entity gets reattached to the 
initiate and the initiate is now a ranked member of this cult or guild or faction and it creates this sort of kill switch for the individuals where if the individual fails to take out a target or fails to uphold their rules or commands or perhaps there's some dissent and there's a deserter in the in the ranks and they're trying to seek them out then you could have essentially a an instance where you have an emergency shutoff where you separate the crawling claw from the individual and the living body of the newly ranked member or any member of this guild or faction falls into a coma into this form of stasis and then perhaps you can impart some form of system as to why they would do that rather than just kill the individual outright perhaps the coma is more beneficial because it allows the necromantic wizard that enacts the ritual of creating the crawling claws for the initiates after successfully taking out their first target perhaps the necromancer feeds off of their life energy and it's better to have a living body that is comatose than it is to have a dead body right so you could create this interesting sort of guild or faction and then if you can start to consider and ponder how big is this faction how long have they been around how far is their reach no pun intended how significant are they what do they have a lot of push and pull are they just sort of a guild of assassins or can they be hired who hires them how are they you know what is the ultimate goal and perhaps the ultimate goal is complete control of the country or continent or world or realm by this guild or, or cult or faction, perhaps it's they are but a smaller outcropping of a much larger evil, and they're sort of behaving as this autonomous entity, but in reality, what they're doing is serving a grander individual who has their own intent, and they're using this faction as a tool of some sort. Perhaps this cult or guild is quite large, actually, and they have chapters sort of all around the land and across the continents and all of that stuff. And the impetus for creating the, these cults or groups was an order or another group of arcanists or necromancers or something to that effect coming together and effectively teaming up to create these factions and essentially having a win-win scenario where they can gain power and control and take out whomever they see fit to take out they can gain riches and stuff like that due to extortion and sort of criminal intimidation and stuff and regardless of what happens they're building an army of either undead servants or living servants and doubly if the living servants choose to dissent or desert or betray or become traitorous they have an immediate kill switch that doesn't even necessarily execute the individual it leaves the individuals alive but comatose where they can be harvested by the necromancers for their life energy and i think that you can impart a pretty cool adventure series of adventures even a campaign using this kind of spider web of cultists or assassins or whatever group or faction that has sort of tears to it finally i could see an adventure being created where this is sort of flipped on its head where the the notion of a murderer being the entity that is required in order to create a crawling claw is actually not necessarily a villain so perhaps there's an individual now you could use an evil arcanist a warlock you could use the necromancer you could even use that faction as well of cultists or assassins or what have you that have this sort of crawling claw reattached to themselves and what they are doing is they're taking perhaps the greatest of heroes or warriors or perhaps even kings or lords or knights or something like that and perhaps they come in at, in the dead of night and they have a, a system let's say that implements crawling claws where they send out crawling claws perhaps to the keep or the castle or anything like that the homestead of this great warrior or soldier or knight or what have you and in the dead of night a spell is cast or something occurs where the individual while they're asleep magically or otherwise perhaps they're bound up by the claws and by the time they wake up it's too late because 
the faction or the individuals have already made their way into the the room of this person. And what they do is, as I mentioned previously, they effectively cut off the hand or hands of the individual. Perhaps the crawling claw sends it back, right? Carries it back to whatever place the spell is placed upon it to convert it into a crawling claw. And then they reattach it. And that could be a very intriguing way of sort of holding all of these people in high status and high positions of power as hostages, effectively, where, you know, even the noblest or most virtuous of rulers or the wisest and most virtuous of warriors is sort of at the behest of this evil entity or evil empire due to the fact that they now have attached to them a corrupted appendage that can lead to them being set comatose or murdered outright at the drop of a hat if they don't bend to the wishes and demands of this evil faction or group, right? Because due to the lore for a crawling claw, the main thing about them is that crawling claws cannot be made by clean hands effectively, right? You need an individual who has some blood on their hands. Now, the greatest knight in a king or queen or emperor's army that has assisted in perhaps taking over a piece of land that was being ransacked by barbarians or brigands or what have you, they're a hero and they've saved the day and saved the land, but they still killed probably a bunch of people in order to protect the land. And murder is murder, right? Regardless of the context or reasoning as to why, right? You can agree or disagree as to whether or not it was a valid course of action or well-deserved, but what it states here in the lore is that it needs to be a murderer. It needs to be someone who kills people. It doesn't have to be necessarily someone who has killed people for the sake of killing them or because they enjoy the way it feels to kill someone or to take a life. It's just a murderer, right? And even killing in the name of something good or virtuous or lawful or wonderful is still killing. So you could create what I think is a very cool scenario or environment where you have a hero or two or a bunch of these heroic individuals. And perhaps these heroic individuals came together even in a, like a justice league type form, right? Where, or Avengers type form where they're all great heroes. They're all great warriors and noble and wise and very humble individuals that have always done what's good and right for everybody and all of that stuff. Perhaps they've all been offered pieces of land to to have a fort built and rule over these patches by whomever rules the land at the time, be it an emperor or king or a queen or empress or even a, a group of holy individuals, some monastic group that has given the land to them as a reward for saving the day, as it were. And they behaved peacefully with each other, amongst each other. They all know that the other individuals are noble individuals and virtuous and are worthy of negotiation and trade and discussion and sharing as opposed to aggressive, violent battle due to the fact that they're not just bloodthirsty savages. But regardless, eventually over time, the cult or group or band of assassins or guild of these people have come in and amputated them and have corrupted their appendages and returned them and stitched them back together. So now they're effectively forever cursed right? Like the curse of the black hand or something like that, right? And ever since that's occurred, these lands that are now under the rule of these once revered individuals have now become the seedy, dark underbelly, the place of nefarious action and evil intent when they used to be these sort of beautiful, peaceful, lawful, bountiful lands. And it's up to your adventurers to find out what happened and hopefully remedy it if they can. All in all, I would have to say that even though I thought the Crawling Claw would be a challenging monster to create adventures and scenarios around, it actually has a lot to it that can be used to flavor Uh, an adventure or campaign or anything in between in a very interesting light, I think. And you don't have to go too far out at all from what's presented to you in the text to create something that I think could entertain and captivate your players and, and want them to keep playing and come back for the next session and see what the outcome is and 
what's going on with all of these sort of strange, undead, amputated digits, if you would. Admittedly, I thought it was going to be pretty challenging to come up with some scenarios and encounters and adventures or and campaigns and stuff like that, implementing the crawling claw at the forefront because it's such a low challenge creature and it's fairly simplistic in its stats, but the amount of lore that's provided to you about them really allows you to develop something there, I think, that can still have crawling claws at the forefront, but not necessarily as the main antagonist or monster of the week that your players will have to contend with. You know, I think that where I thought it was going to be difficult was in using a crawling claw as the main monster that your players would have to combat. And you could still do something to that effect, like I said earlier on, with a swarm of them and stuff like that. But there's a lot to the Crawling Claw that can be used in effectively sort of setting a tone and establishing all sorts of extensions and extending all sorts of aspects to your campaign just by use of the Crawling Claw as a tool. But that's all I got for you fine folks today when it comes to the Crawling Claw. I'd like to thank you all once again very much for tuning in. I highly appreciate it. And I've actually become curious whether or not any of these episodes that I'm making for you guys have yet to assist you with generating adventures or encounters or even just giving you some ideas. So feel free to let me know either on YouTube in the comments or if you'd like to let me know via email, you can email me at maxmccool.dm at gmail.com and let me know what you guys think and whether or not I've helped out and these have been a help or if they're completely useless and I should stop doing this or if you folks out there just enjoy listening to it for the sake of listening to it. But once again, thank you very much. If you're listening to this episode of Monsters Manifested on YouTube, I'd kindly ask that you like, comment, share, subscribe, all of that fun stuff as it would help me out, help my channel out, help the podcast out, and all in all would be awesome. Next week's episode, we're going to be covering yet another legendary creature from real world mythology and legend with the Cyclops. So that should be pretty interesting. I think we'll have a lot there to chew on and work from, and we should be able to come up with some pretty cool stuff, I think. But until then... Thank you once again for tuning in, and I'll catch you on the next one. Have a good day, everyone.